So hello uh, and welcome to um, today's uh, TEC SPCA European webinar. Uh, my name is Harry Kallison. I'm an associate professor here at Toulouse School of Economics and the current uh, president of um, the Society for uh, Benefit Consonants. So I will provide a, a short introduction to, to um, the uh, SPCA and um, the background for this uh, webinar that we are going to host today before I give the word, uh, the floor to uh, today's moderator and uh, the speakers. So the um, Society for Medical Analysis is, is relatively young, about uh, 15 uh, years old, and it was um, established at the University of Washington in 2007 with um, a generous grant from the MacArthur Foundation. And this is a society that aims to um, make sure that we use economics in uh, decision making, policy decision making. So it's a society with aim to, to provide a bridge or a platform for uh, people from research and the uh, policy sector um, to meet and, and work together. And uh, the society has organized its conference in the US, Washington, DC, since uh, 2008. Um, so every year the conference has been organized uh, in Washington DC and uh, we, uh, we saw an interest from, from Europe. So um, in 2019, we decided to organize the first European uh, conference. It was organized uh, here, as I say, since I'm in Toulouse, at the Toulouse School of Economics. And then uh, we organized a conference in Stockholm in 2021. It was postponed due to COVID from 2020 and organized by, by BTI. And uh, last year, uh, Paris School of Economics organized the conference in Paris. And for those interested, I'm very happy to, to um, inform you about the conference in Milan in September, September 11 and 12. Uh, so that's the fourth European conference that we've organized. Uh, call fast like have been closed, but uh, registration has recently been open. And, uh, we had a record number of submissions this year, so that would be a, a great conference. But um, I would not keep you too long from listening to our, our excellent speakers. Uh, so for more information, please visit um, the, um, the web page of the Society. We have the link here on, on the slide, where you can also um, find information about our journal, the Journal of Benefit Cost Analysis. Um, about the um, European webinar, um, it's a joint event by the Toulouse School of Economics and the Society of Advanced Cost Analysis. Um, this year is the third webinar. And the first one uh, took place in 2021, where we have um, Professor Sir Prata Dasgupta as a speaker, uh, talk about biodiversity, Ion Wolfstone as the discussant. And last year, Mal uh, Veguan uh, talked about the infrastructure and, and energy. And you can find the recordings to those uh, presentation on the link provided here on the web page. Um, so this year, um, I'm very happy to, to announce um, the, the moderator, Dr. Dovamas Jorge Calderon at the European Investment Bank, and our panelists, uh, Professor Susanna Marata at LSE, Massimo Florio at the University of Seca di Milano, and Emil Kine at the Paris School of Economics. Uh, so a huge thank you to all of you for uh, taking time off to um, participate in this, this event. And of course, also a special thank to uh, Stephanie and Lisa here at TC and the Foundation Jacqueline Fund to make sure that we can actually have this, this event. We need someone behind the scenes to actually make that thing happen. But with that uh, very brief introduction, I give the floor to uh, Dorbas. Uh, to introduce uh, himself and the speakers. Thanks, Thomas. Thank you very much, Enric. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Drama Jorge Calderon, and I'm an economist at the European uh, Investment Bank. Uh, the EIB is the project financing arm of the European Union, and we are heavy users of CBA. Um, you will be able to find a guide to our economic appraisal or how we perform CBAs and, and uh, um, cost effectiveness analysis and sometimes multi-criteria analysis that we use for to appraise our projects and you can find it in in, in Google you know, through in, on the website this is an open document 
I, I specialized in the, um, in the appraisal of transport and particularly aviation projects. Um, and uh, but in the AIB, we do projects pretty much across all sectors of the economy with the exception of defense and so on. Um, today, we have a very distinguished set of uh, speakers. Um, we are going to, I mean, each one of them is going to speak for about 20 minutes and we're going to leave the Q&A uh, to the end. The duration of the seminar is um, one, one and a half hours starting at uh, three uh, CET. Um, and we will start, we will follow an order which is uh, by alphabetical order from first name in inversely. So we start with uh, Susana Murato, then we'll follow with Massimo Florio and finally with uh, Emil Kine. Susana Murato will be the first one to speak and she's going to be talking to us about and including well-being measures in CBA, a very innovative area of, of CBA practice. She's uh, Vice President for Research and Professor of Environmental Economics at the London School of Economics, where she leads the efforts and the development of research at the, at the institution. Her research interests are into social value measurement, uh, particularly when applied to environmental health and cultural heritage goods and services. Um, she specializes also, she specializes in areas of subjective well-being and behavioral economics. And she has over 120 scientific publications and four books, uh, as well as a long track record of advising institutions across the world. With that, Susana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Doramas. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for coming. I'm going to share my screen and just let me know if it's um, working. Is it sharing? Can you see it? Yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, okay, brilliant. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, the use of well-being measures and, and, and um, methods in cost-benefit analysis in the UK. I mean, this is quite an innovative thing to do, a pioneering thing to do. And I'll leave it up to you to decide whether it's a good thing or a bad thing to do after, after you see what, what we've been doing in, in, in the UK. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the background for uh, the use of well-being measures in the UK and for our green book. And then I'm going to talk about well-being in the green book, well-being and valuation and current and future challenges associated with this approach. So well-being in, in UK policy, the, the, the UK government and various UK governments have had welfare or well-being the pop of the population in mind. We had that uh, since, you know, David Cameron, Conservative government a few years ago, and even our, our, our Labour politicians uh, at the moment, they, they said that well-being uh, is essential for, for how they want to judge the impact of projects uh, in, 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 in society. So it, it is across parties and um, well-being has been officially measured in the UK since 1991 uh, through our British Household Panel Survey. And importantly, since 2011, our Office for National Statistics has started measuring uh, well-being on a regular basis. So we now have a lot of data on well-being in, in the UK. And by well-being, I mean, there's many definitions of well-being, but the Office for National Statistics defines well-being as how we are doing as individuals, communities and as a nation and how sustainable this is for the future. So basically, they're talking about individual from a, a personal perspective and subjective well-being. So reports of satisfaction, purpose, happiness, anxiety, that type of thing. That's sort of the, the core use of well-being in, in policy at the moment. They also produce other, other indicators of well-being for communities and so on. But the ones I've been talking about today are personal subjective measures of well-being. And just to be clear, these are the types of questions that are asked in the Office for National Statistics and that are relevant for what we are talking today. There's the standard life satisfaction question on well-being. Overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? Measured on a scale from zero to 10, zero being no life satisfaction at all, 10 being the maximum uh, satisfaction. 
But there's also other questions in the in the Office for National Statistics. One of them is about what we call eudaimonic well-being, which is um, the extent to which people feel that the things they do in their life is worthwhile, are worthwhile. And the question is there on the screen. To what extent do you feel that the things you do are worthwhile? Um, that's also measured in the in the Office for National Statistics. And the final one is a more instant measure of well-being, um, mood measuring a person's mood either on the spot or the day before in the case of the Office for National Statistics. How happy did you feel yesterday and how anxious did you feel yesterday? A positive and a negative measure of this um, mood, emotion, feeling. So these, these four uh, questions are asked in the Office for National Statistics, but the one that's most commonly used, including cost-benefit analysis, is the first one. How satisfied are you with your life nowadays? The life satisfaction measure is the most popular. So in the UK, we have a green book, uh, which is actually green. That's the cover of the book, the green book. And it describes how major public sector investment um, projects, policies, programs, regulations are assessed. It's a fundamental book. It's hugely influential and it drives everything. It drives how government agencies and everyone else um, evaluates their, 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 their projects. It basically sets the rules of the game in the UK. So anything that goes in this book is very influential because people will then start applying it and looking at it and trying to learn how to do these things if it's part of the official guidance. So hugely influential, it's, it sets the rules of how we do appraisal in the UK. Um, it's a relatively short book. The actual core of the book is 84 pages, but then it has a lot of um, the guidance, the detailed guidance on how to do things are in the annexes. There's 53 pages of annexes and in the supplementary material. And there's many separate publications with this supplementary material. And in 2022, uh, the new edition, so the, the book is updated every so often, but the, the most recent edition in 2022 includes supplementary guidance on using well-being in cost-benefit analysis. And there's 87 pages of supplementary guidance. So there's a lot there uh, to, 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 to sort of think through on how to use well-being in, um, in, the, in the green book. So it's a, in, in cost-benefit analysis. So it's a relative recent sort of development, um, you know, the detailed guidance on, on how to do this. The, the whole focus of, of appraisal in the UK is on well-being. So the, 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 uh, there's a quote there on the slide from the Green Book that says the appraisal of social value, also called uh, public value, it's um, based on the principles of welfare economics. And it's really about um, including all the costs and benefits that affect the well-being in society. So the ultimate aim is to measure well-being. So that's there in the, in the, in the, as a basis of the, of the, the, of the Green Book. Um, and, and by well-being, they mean how people feel. So it's the subjective well-being. So that's at the core of cost-benefit analysis in the UK. And the well-being um, affects a range of, of sort of um, areas in policy development. It affects the initial research. If we look at well-being research, it might reveal what matters to people, which means then politicians want to um, create policies that help those particular areas that are found to affect well-being the most. It also helps at the strategic stage. It can inform the choices of, of, of uh, priorities for governments uh, based on these uh, measures of well-being. And, and going to cost-benefit analysis, it can inform the range of implementation options that we have by looking at the well-being effects of those, of those options or the populations that are affected or how, how much they are affected. And then it affects the actual cost-benefit analysis with the short list of options. It can inform the costs and benefits of the options, and I'll talk more about this in, in, the, in the talk. And it's, of course, useful as well for monitoring and evaluation of policies because well-being is also an outcome. What is the well-being of these particular policies? So it also is helpful for evaluating the impacts of the policies ex post. But um, in terms of the actual conducting cost-benefit analysis, uh, the Green Book says that, like, like most other uh, appraisal manuals, that all re relevant costs and benefits should be valued in monetary terms as much as possible. Uh, and well-being, the, the measuring the impacts on well-being are central to this aim. And if we can, we should monetize everything. If we don't have enough um, monetized um, values that are robust enough, then we at least should um, quantify uh, effects in some way, for example, just in well-being terms or um, qualitatively describe what's going on. But the key aim is to try and monetize as much as, much as possible. 
like with any other cost benefit analysis. And then the Green Book uh, actually lists all the methodologies that are approved and recommended by uh, the UK government for, for, for doing this type of appraisal. And in terms of non-market um, methods, you have the very commonly known revealed preference methods, stated preference methods, both willingness to pay and willingness to accept, in addition to the usual market prices. But the new kid on the block and the thing that's uh, sort of been uh, inserted recently into the guidance is that we can also use uh, direct well-being responses from surveys and from data and um, the value of, of, of that well-being estimated through subjective well-being valuation methods, which are different from revealed and stated preferences. So now, although there's very little evidence um, and not a great body of knowledge about well-being valuation, subjective well-being valuation, it's been put on a, on the same level as things that we know a lot about, like revealed and stated preferences that we have, you know, decades of um, evidence and uh, experience on. So it's, it's an interesting thing to do, to put subjective well-being valuation methods and measures on the same level playing field as the others, where we have a lot more evidence on. Um, and of course, now it will instigate new research because it's on, it's on the Green Book. It's a new frontier in envi environmental valuation using subjective well-being valuation, which I'll describe in a moment. It makes uses of new types of data, namely um, well-being data, like the one collected by our Office for National Statistics. Most countries now collect data on well-being, so we have a very large body of evidence across the world on well-being. And so it uses that, those types of data. But less is known about these methods and their limitations. We don't have decades of experience on this. We don't have um, data uh, going back many, many years um, on, on this. So this is a case where we ask, is the guidance ahead of the research and the evidence? Um, and it's not a bad thing to, to be ahead, but you know, it might, maybe it forces the direction in a particular way. But it's an interesting thing that we have this guidance that seems somehow to be ahead of the you know all the all the research and the evidence uh, on on these methods and and these metrics, it is recognised in, in the green book that it is a methodology that continues to evolve and it may be particularly useful in certain policy areas where the other valuation methods are not so strong. For, for example, measuring um, community cohesion, volunteering, things like that, where we don't really use uh, standard valuation methods to measure that, but maybe well-being valuation methods are better to measure some of these effects. That's uh, at least the, the hope. Right, so what do we need to actually do uh, valuation using well-being measures rather than the other methods? Well, the first thing is we need to have very robust measures of the impact on well-being of particular policies. So if we have a policy to reduce unemployment, what is the effect on well-being? We need to have those metrics readily available for able to be able to use these methodologies in a simple way for policymakers to be able to use this. And we know that um, the confidence in well-being measures will tend to be highest if they come from random control trials, because that's the, the highest level of, of uh, sort of quality of, 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 of these measurements or where you have natural experiments. For example, if someone won the lottery, that's completely random. We can check what their well-being, the effect on their well-being is from this random event. So we could have um, these random conditions or random controlled trials, and those are the best ways to come up with these well-being measures. However, there's only a tiny, tiny number of studies that measure well-being in this way. The majority of studies are cross-sectional studies and surveys on well-being that are not random controlled trials and do not um, uh, replicate randomization. And we could still have some confidence in those measurements if they come from large-scale cross-sectional studies that are repeated over time, the results being repeated over time, repeated across geographies with certain level of confidence. But we can't have much confidence in uh, little studies with a very low power of explanation about particular issues. So there's a whole body of evidence that cannot really be used uh, robustly for cost-benefit analysis. So we're still a long way of having a ready reckoner table that can tell us what is the lifetime well-being of a policy on unemployment or a policy to reduce depression or whatever the policy might be. We don't have the data yet, so there's a lot of work to be done in getting the well-being data associated with policies. Um, the second thing that we that we need then is to value it. Okay, so we have the well-being measure of a policy. What's the value of it? In monetary terms, we need to monetize it. And the Green Book, this latest version, goes a step 
further, it's quite a, 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 a radical thing to do, and, pre and presents um, a sort of a, a measure of, um, of a value of, uh, of well-being of, um, well, first they, they, they describe a, a well-being measure called a well-be. So a well-be is a one-point change in life satisfaction for one year. So if your well-being changes by one point over one year, that's a well-be. So they define this well-be. And, and then they say, looking at the literature, that the value of a well-be is £13,000. And I'll explain how they get to that value. £13,000. So basically, they have this number that they're recommending and means that if you have a policy that changes, reduces life satisfaction by 0.4 uh, for one year, then the value of that policy will be 0.4 of £13,000 which is £5,200. So there'll be an easy way of policymakers using um, well-being uh, measures and being able to monetize them in an easy way by having this value of a well-being. Now, how do we calculate these well-beings? Is this, uh, is, uh, this, this valuation, is, 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 is this reliable? Well, there's two approaches to calculate uh, a well-being. Um, and the first approach is, and there's a lot of stuff on the slide, but I'm just explaining very quickly what this is. Um, it's based on a few studies and it's based on uh, what's done in the health literature where they have the concept of a quality, a quality adjusted life year. And the quality is the value of an additional life year lived with no problems in, in full health by a person. That's, that's what uh, a quality is. And there are monetary values as a, a literature, a small literature that um, found out the value of or proposed the value for a quality. Um, so one quality is worth £60,000 um, as per the Green Book guidance. One quality is worth that. So what this literature did, it's tried to um, match qualities with well-bees. And so they note that the average life satisfaction of someone in full health is eight on a scale of zero to 10. So someone in full health has an average life satisfaction of eight. And someone with no uh, health at all um, aligns with a life satisfaction of about one. So they say that one quality is uh, the difference between one and eight. So one quality is equivalent of seven uh, well-beings, seven life satisfaction measures. Therefore, to get to a well-being from a quality, you divide by seven. And so you get 10,000 pounds. So this is how it's done. It's a bit, um, you know, there's, I'd like to see more evidence on this and more sort of theoretic background, theoretical background for this, but it's an easy thing to apply and it's supposedly transparent. Well, it's explained in, in the book how this is done based on the qualities and these kinds of assumptions. The second way in which this can be measured is um, by um, estimating the willingness to pay for a life satisfaction change. And basically that uh, means we need to have a regression where we relate life satisfaction with income. And all we have to do is look at the coefficient of income. So when income changes, what happens to life satisfa satisfaction? And that gives us an idea of how much people value life satisfaction in monetary terms from this regression where you regress life satisfaction on income. And a recent literature shows that the coefficient of income is 1.96. And um, you know, if, you, if we use the marginal rate of substitution between income and life satisfaction, it gives us a willingness to pay for a well-be of 16,000 pounds. So that's just using the regression between life satisfaction and income and using and looking at the coefficient. So a well-be from this approach is 16,000 pounds, from the previous approach was 10,000 pounds. And so the government uh, chooses us there as their uh, suggested value of this well-be of this one uh, point in life satisfaction over a year of £13,000. That's how they reach the estimate. But it's all based on a very small amount of literature sources, not the body of evidence that we have for the other methods. So, you know, this is something to consider. And there's a lot more work that needs to be done on finding out how meaningful the well-be is and how meaningful this £13,000 is. Um, of course, if we don't think this is, um, we can do cost benefit analysis on this, we can also do cost effectiveness analysis um, using this well be approach, where all we have to do is look at the costs of policies and measuring the outcome of the policy in terms of well being. So, a policy that produces uh, 20 well bees, we would look at what's the, the best way of achieving that uh, with a minimum cost. So, the usual cost effectiveness analysis can also be done with this well be uh, approach. So what are the challenges of this? We're still not closed. This is a radical new way of choosing public policies on the basis of impacts of well-being alone. 
But we're not close to be saying that we have an approved way of doing this. I mean, it's in the guidance, but it's based on not a lot of evidence at the moment. And there's no theoretical framework at the moment that explains all this. There's some, but uh, not an, a sort of approved one. And there's much less knowledge or, 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 and evidence on, on, on first, the well-being effects of policies. We don't have a table that tells us what are the well-being effects of all these policies in all these areas. And we also don't have methods uh, to do it that are well, um, uh, you know, that are well trialed. I, I've just told you about the quality approach and the willingness to pay approach, but they're new. There's not many, there's not a body of literature on this or a small body of literature on this. So there's many issues in the measurement, uh, interpersonal comparison of well-being. Um, we're using life satisfaction, but there are other forms of well-being. What if well-being effects are short-lived? Because people adapt and then the, the well-being is the same. Uh, how do, do we discount well-being? Um, they propose to use the same discount rate as for, for health effects, which is 1.5%. How do we account for non-use values? So there's so many questions around this. Um, and ultimately, uh, we do need uh, for policymakers to be able to use this. We need an empirical record, a table that people can just go and say, well, these are the values that I want to use. So they came up with the Wellbees to provide that kind of ready reckoner table. But the approach is based on a very small literature and a very large number of approaches. Um, and there are many other well-being measures in, um, out there in the, in the literature that are different from this. And it doesn't apply to non-marginal changes because it assumes that uh, we apply this 13,000 uh, pounds to any um, in a linear fashion. And so if the changes are non-marginal, uh, non then this doesn't apply. And how do we embed this in policy analysis? Are people really using this approach? Well, it's in the Green Book, but it's not widely used as yet. Um, and, and, it, and this is a very UK thing. Is it used elsewhere? So is the guidance running ahead of the research and the evidence? That's the question that I want to leave with you today to, to think about. It's exciting, but there's a lot of question marks around this. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, <clears throat> Um, very, very interesting, and I'm starting to have a feeling that we will be very short in terms of times for Q&A, because uh, I'm sure that uh, your topic will generate a lot of, uh, a lot of reaction from the, from the audience. Um, we um, will hear next uh, Professor uh, Massimo Florio. He is a professor of public economics at the University of Milan and is the co-chair of the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence on the impact of European Union research and innovation policy. He has expertise in uh, uh, social cost benefit analysis, regional and industrial policy, and economics of science and innovation. And of course, anyone's had to do anything to do with uh, getting EU DG Regio funds from Europe will have come across the guide to cost benefit analysis of the European, uh, of the European Commission, with professor, which Professor Florio coordinated in, in the various editions uh, that, that, uh, that, that it had. Um, his book uh, on investing in science has recently published in 2019 by the uh, MIT press, and uh, he's led most recently uh, research and advice to, for the European Parliament on issues to do with the pharm pharmaceutical research and development, and more specific with the development of COVID-19 vaccines. And Professor Florio is going to be talking to us today about CBA in the EU's institutional framework. Massimo, please. You're, you're muted. You're muted, Massimo. Okay, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, okay. So um, my, my topic is um, um, an answer to a question, which is the question of how relevant is what we do? Do governments really care about our work on cost benefit analysis? Because uh, particularly for academics, uh, it is, um, a, a um, let, let, let's say the most important professional professional risk that uh, you are unable to really influence um, the the policy. Um, so uh, instead of trying to um, 
to answer myself to the question, um, I, I will tell you the initial results, the results of a survey in which we have answered uh, experts about what is going on uh, about the uh, actual usage of cost-benefit analysis in member states of the European uh, Union beyond the role of the Euro European Union institutions. So this is the, the, the question. Um, the, the survey we have recently uh, launched, um, particularly with my colleague Raffaele Articolo, is uh, inspired by a previous survey by the OECD and by um, previous work uh, we have done uh, at, at sealing certain areas such as uh, transport, social discount rate, um, and, and so on. We also have been looking at uh, a quite recent OECD uh, regulatory outlook, uh, but we are also uh, aware of uh, the work of the OECD in cost benefit analysis and the environment and uh, uh, Susanna, uh, knows well that particular uh, uh, contribution. So the issue here is uh, okay. We 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 try and uh, to to uh, uh, go ahead with methodologies in in cost benefit analysis, but uh, are we able to uh, convince governments to to use it? And these are the topics that uh, uh, we we have asked. Uh, to a, a sample of uh, uh, potential uh, respondents uh, and, and experts. And I will tell you something for uh, each um, of these. But uh, with uh, the proviso that this is uh, an, 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 in, an initial uh, preliminary um, uh, presentation, because what we want to do uh, in future is uh, to um, um, go ahead with the survey until the European Conference of the Society for Benefit Cost Analysis. Um, to, to set the frame, um, thank you, Dora Mas. You have remembered that uh, there are uh, several cost benefit analysis uh, uh, guides uh, um, supported by uh, particularly the European Commission, the G Regional Policy. Um, and uh, some of you and some of the participants have been invest have been involved in this in this effort. And in fact, there is a, a, a long story uh, be behind all all this that started in 1994 with a slim uh, booklet. Um, now that I am a little bit uh, less uh, uh, hands-on, the number of pages collapsed from uh, um, 364 to 98, but in fact, the uh, uh, 98 uh, uh, Vademecum, um, uh, in collaboration, by the way, with Jaspers and the European Investment Bank and uh, uh, the Commission, for a number of applications uh, still mentions the 2014 uh, guide. Uh, as Dora Mas mentioned, the, the uh, European Investment Bank is uh, the other driving force uh, behind uh, the spread of cost-benefit analysis in Europe at uh, the Milano conference. Uh, we'll uh, be very happy to host uh, a presentation by uh, Dora Mas Jorge Calderon, uh, about the new edition of, uh, of the guide, very br brand, brand new, and I will be honored to be uh, the one who will introduce and, and, and comment about this. Dora Mas, this is probably a surprise for you. I, I didn't mention <laughs> to you before. Um, uh, I, I really would urge everybody to uh, download this, this document, uh, which uh, is, uh, that, in my opinion, uh, uh, is, uh, is, is there to stay. It, it really contributes to, to, to the discipline. Uh, so uh, please download the new edition of the UK Green Book. And this one, these two things are, should be in uh, your, your shelves. Uh, uh, next, please. Uh, okay. Uh, no, it's okay. Um, by the way, there are other other uh, bodies um, at EU level, at the 
level of the European Commission or uh, the European Space Agency uh, that regularly perform uh, cost-benefit analysis. But my focus now is uh, on member states. Um, also because uh, most of the public expenditure uh, is managed not by the European institutions, but by the member states. So how far have we academic been successful in convincing member states to use the, the tools that we have shaped over, over time? Um, so these are the initial results from uh, 48 respondents, uh, 24 member states. There are three still missing, but uh, by September, I can promise that uh, all member states will be on, on board. And uh, there is an interesting mixture of respondents uh, uh, between uh, uh, public administration, private uh, sector, and, uh, and academia. Let's start with uh, the... Uh, First question, which is uh, whether whether or not it is uh, uh, mandatory um, to uh, use uh, uh, cost-benefit analysis. It is mandatory in uh, in nine countries, uh, but in other five, it is mandatory for projects above a certain threshold. So uh, it seems there is, uh, with uh, the exception of four countries, there is the large majority of countries where CBA is firmly within the um, legal framework. There is a legal base, which in my experience is, uh, is very important, not just in Europe. In, uh, in the US, very recently, uh, there is a, a draft revision of the guidelines, uh, of the federal guidelines uh, from, uh, for public investment. Uh, and uh, those guidelines uh, uh, played a, a, an important role in, in the US as, as well. Um, so in terms of uh, the, the decision process, it seems that CBA is used particularly uh, for uh, justification of uh, project sele selection or, or decisions uh, while less uh, understood is the role that to me is very important for uh, policy for policy learning. Um, so this is a more traditional justification, which is in a sense confirmed by the fact that uh, um, uh, CBA is regarded by I, our respondents as a part of a package of tools. Um, that help governments to take their decisions about um, investment investment projects. Um, it is interesting also that uh, most of the work is uh, uh, done at the pre-feasibility stage uh, quite, uh, quite early. Uh, and uh, uh, only in, in uh, uh, 12 member states, uh, there is uh, some evidence of uh, a uh, um, ex post uh, CBA, which in a sense is, uh, is a shame because in my opinion and in perspective of policy learning, uh, ex post CBA is as important as uh, uh, ex ante. I am not uh, advocating having a one-to-one one -one, uh, ratio, but um, I think it would be wise to do, to do so. Uh, to have more systematically an uh, exposed analysis. Uh, who does this? Uh, mostly consulting companies hired by the project sponsor. This, in my opinion, is uh, not necessarily a, a strong point. I would be personally more happy uh, to see um, that an evaluation unit uh, somewhere in the central government or at the sectoral level line department uh, is there. As you can see, this is just uh, in four or five um, uh, member states. Um, there, there, there is a question in the, sur in, in the, in the survey whether there are uh, methodological uh, guidelines. Uh, and um, on this, there is also evidence um, that uh, in the majority of the member states, uh, there are those guidelines. This is uh, from a document uh, um, 
in, in the chat you may uh, find the link. Uh, this is uh, in the Vademecum, delivered by uh, the, um, the European Commission, and you may see that some countries have a number of, uh, um, uh, not just of general guidelines, but also of uh, specific guidelines, particularly in transport, in environment, and others. Uh, Ireland is an example, but also uh, Poland or, uh, or Germany. Um, um, uh, usually we are interested, we economists, we are usually interested in the um, uh, social discount rate. The, the variation across countries is now surprisingly high, as you can see according our respondents, with less than 2% in, in Germany and close to 7% uh, in uh, um, a Baltic uh, uh, country. And certainly this is something that we have to uh, study a little bit more, why there is such uh, big uh, variations. In terms of sectors, you would not be surprised to see that still uh, um, cost-benefit analysis refers uh, to transport in its uh, different modes. But personally, I'm particularly happy to see that now in four or five countries, there is uh, also uh, projects in scientific research and technological development and innovation in the scope of cost-benefit analysis, which is something I have been working on in, uh, in, the, last, uh, in the last years. Um, the overall uh, 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 assessment by the respondents is that uh, uh, there is a, uh, an impact in terms of increased efficiency in, uh, in, public, uh, in public spending with just one uh, expert uh, more pessimistic in, in one country. But uh, this is not too bad uh, after, after all. And, um, and also there is uh, um, great variability in terms of when uh, governments started to do systematically cost-benefit analysis with in some countries since the 70s and uh, others just uh, joined. Okay, I, I, I would conclude now with uh, um, um, two invitations. The first invitation is uh, uh, for all participants to this uh, webinar to contribute themselves. You will you would find uh, in, uh, in the chat now, I hope, uh, this link that would uh, uh, lead you to um, a set of questions that will take, I promise, five to 10 minutes um to answer and the idea is to uh, deliver the results uh, at the fourth european conference of the society for benefit cost analysis that uh, as uh, eric announced is going to be in milan uh, organized by my uh, department with the society uh, 11 and 12 uh, september uh, we have now a large number of uh, submissions, so it seems uh, the program will be really uh, rich. And uh, uh, again, in the website, uh, you uh, in uh, sorry in the chat, you can uh, see uh, the um, the link uh, for a registration if you still uh, would like to join this uh, uh, this conference. So thank you very much. Many, many thanks, Massimo. Um, of course, uh, anyone who has already questions to post to either uh, Susanna or Massimo, if you if you could please type them on the Q and A um, uh, facility, and then I would administer and and, and edit it and uh, and deliver the questions to to the to the speakers. Um, Next, uh, we have Emil Kine. He is a emeritus professor at the Ecole de Pont Paris Tech. Uh, he's an associate member of the Paris School of Economics and is a member of the French Academy of Technology. His fields of exper expertise are uh, transport economics, public economics, and cost-benefit analysis. 
Anne Emil is going to be talking to us today about the challenges for CBA in a period of ecological transition. Emil, please. Emil, you're, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, do you hear me? Yes, thank you, yes. Okay, so the ideas I will present you are based on the idea that the transition period, the ecological transition period where we are raises new challenges and implies new answers for CBA and especially on how to implement it and on its role in helping the decision-making process. <coughs> Uh, what following uh, uh, what uh, I cannot I cannot uh, go to the next one. Just click on the presentation then no. Oh yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> so uh, let us first uh, remind the traditional framework of CBA. In oversimplified terms, it uh, uh, CBA considers a small marginal project at the margin of a macro and meso economic scenario and checks its net present value. <laughs> the scenario. Uh, implying uh, macroeconomic evolution, such as, such as uh, GDP growth, price evolution, and uh, the, the state of regulation, is uh, mainly a matter of forecast based on extrapolation of the past. And in the traditional framework of CBA2, in which uh, many of the current projects are still are appraised, some attention is paid to risk but usually not given any important role. Almost no account to uncertainty. I distinguish between risk, which is probabilizable, probabilizable and uncertainty, which cannot be probabilized. Uh, these frameworks uh, no longer holds. Extrapolating the past is no more possible. At the country level, as well as the international level, ambitious policy aiming at coping with gro uh, global externality are uh, in operation. They imply dramatic changes in key sectors, which are often the main subject of uh, CBA, which are energy, transport, building and land use, agriculture too. And uh, with uh, some uh, important characteristics, first that those change must be coordinated, you cannot think of uh, uh, an evolution of transport uh, without any consequences on the energy supply, power supply, for instance, uh, due to the rhythm of uh, decarbonation and electrification of means of transport. In all those <coughs> sectors and changes, huge externalities are implied. Market solution does not work and public intervention is needed. And also, uh, accessorily, the success of these policies depends on international and domestic cooperation. Uh, on top of that, uh, risk and uncertainty, which took not a very large part in uh, previous uh, missiles, are now pervasive. Decision, however, why, uh, while uh, the current CBA uh, procedure does not work well. Decision, however, need more and more light. And uh, the general idea about this uh, is that you must use scenario, uh, but how? How to? So first, I will see how to design scenario. Scenario uh, would imply input. Uh, including uh, both external framework, such as international uh, agreement, technological progress, uh, level of climate change, and so on, and also collective targets, as many countries or group of countries or region 
as a fixed uh, objectives, quantified, quantified objectives in terms of decarbonation and or, also protection of biodiversity. <laughs> so scenario, uh, which are uh, of course uh, macroeconomic, uh, should uh, give way to outputs, uh, which are for each sector of the economy programs, uh, indicating, for instance, uh, in the case of transport, the volume of traffic, the share of public transport, uh, and the, the length of uh, uh, new uh, public transport uh, line uh, built, and so on. And also, not only program for each sector, but also tools to reach those programs, such as uh, shadow price and taxes, regulation, research, information, and so on. And of course, the uh, common idea on these uh, points are uh, to have a central scenario and also uh, several other scenarios uh, taking into account, into account the main street and uh, uncertainties. But the point is uh, how to determine the outputs of each scenario. The outputs are programs and tools. <laughs> Ideally, uh, we should use economic optimization and here, cost-benefit analysis should play a new role there, uh, a role which uh, right now is not often used in order to uh, define the, uh, the decision uh, at, the, at the sector level. But uh, this new role of CBA is, uh, has a lot of a problem. The first problem is the problem of implementation because uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, designing a scenario, you have a lot of variant, possible variants to assess in terms of tools and programs. Uh, if you uh, use too few variants, uh, too few variants, you have a risk, a strong risk of under optimization. And if you have too many variants, you have a lot of complexity very uh, difficult to deal with. Uh, and another problem is a problem of procedure as a determination of outputs implies a lot of political decision, such as decision on taxes, regulation, and also infrastructure. And uh, those decisions uh, present a lot of uh, problem of acceptability, acceptability and political agreement. Uh, we are, uh, we see uh, currently right now uh, how uh, many uh, decisions uh, taken in terms of taxes and in terms of program for power supply are uh, not conform to the uh, economic analysis for uh, political reason, for sake of political reason and acceptability. So the uh, so scenario should be set not uh, isolately uh, by uh, economists or by any actors, but uh, be, by consultation between actors and also endorsed by the public authorities. There is also a problem of tools to uh, optimize so the scenario. Uh, the tool provided by uh, economic theory uh, are uh, a bit uh, feeble on the side of risk and uncertainty. Classical risk analysis uh, through utility expectation is of uh, uh, moderate help as uh, many of uh, risk uh, is uh, on the form of ambiguity of uncertainty and ambiguity theory is not enough robust uh, right now, to my opinion, at least, to provide a robust solution able to convince uh, political decision makers. Well, uh, once anyway, once a scenario uh, would have been uh, designed, uh, we have to assess each individual project and to ensure coherence between project and programs. Uh, here we come back to the usual field of CBA, 
uh, and the, the general principle of one noun uh, to recon and PV at each project using the framework set by the previous step uh, in terms of taxes, regulation, information, such a price, and so on, the tools. And theoretically, the program, uh, the process procedure should allow to fulfill the program. The lot of uh, the, the set of uh, projects uh, passing the NPV uh, criterion should, uh, uh, should give just the, the level of program which, is, uh, optim which has been of optimized. In fact, there will be gap between programs and the same of individual projects and a problem arise how to, to fill this gap. We have here a, a classical uh, arbitrage between price and quantity. Uh, usually the main, uh, the main uh, objective of public policy in terms of transition are expressed in terms of quantities and uh, the economist translates them in terms of price, but uh, if there is not, not a perfect match, you have to choose uh, between them. Uh, so uh, the, the, the procedure I, I suggest, I have uh, uh, very quickly uh, analyzed, uh, seems very logic. Uh, it may be, uh, it may seem also uh, a bit ambitious and it's not sure that it will be possible to, to put it uh, at the end. Uh, but uh, my view is that uh, this, uh, this, state, uh, this state of mind is a good one to uh, necessary good, uh, is the only one possible to have uh, uh, a logical way to address a new CBA uh, challenge. And the main message I would uh, leave to your uh, reaction are uh, that the threat to climate change introduce new challenge for CBA. Uh, first, extrapolation of past tendency does not work. And second, the future is made of public decision and uncertainties. Uh, so CBA should be adapted to this new situation along the following line. First, CBA should be more often used for program assessment and adapted to this tax, which is not, uh, uh, which pose, uh, may uh, pose a lot of uh, difficulties. Uh, second, the process of uh, decision making and CBA implementation should pay more attention to the currency between programs and individual project. <coughs> Second, uh, I've already mentioned the uh, problem of taking into account uncertainty. Uh, and uh, top of that, the whole procedure of setting programs and choosing individual project should involve more cooperation between the actor of the process, economists, public authority, and private actor, which uh, up to now in uh, each specific uh, individual uh, project acted uh, relatively independently. So thank you for your reaction of this idea and uh, thank you for attention. Many thanks, Emil. Uh, I mean, in, indeed, I mean, we now at the European Investment Bank um, Two, three years ago, we were turning to the uh, climate bank of the EU, which means that 50% of our lending has to go to climate action um, investments. So directly involving either adapting or mitigating climate change and 100% of our investments since uh, three years ago have to be uh, Paris aligned. But the, the emphasis on investing in technologies to adapt to uh, climate change or to mitigate climate change uh, has faced, has forced us to face uh, a new world of increased uncertainty. Huh? So, some of that, some of that has been um, 
managed by, by putting in a scenario to the price, so the social cost of carbon, okay? But even so, even so, all the technological alternatives that we face and, and the need to invest in them uh, still leave analysts like me uh, doing conducting CBA, um, for, forcing us to, to exert a, a very high degree of, 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 of judgment on the, when we perform uh, CBA. So, so by, by all means, uh, a, most, a most relevant issue, and that is bound to remain very relevant for, 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 for years, years to come. So um, to the uh, audience, again, if you have questions, please post them on the Q&A, uh, preferably um, identify the speaker to whom you would like to uh, the, the question post. I think we've had three fascinating, truly fascinating presentations. I mean, we've, we've seen at the state of, uh, of, of CBA use uh, across Europe, paying particular attention on the, on the European Union by, by, by Massimo Florio. Emil has, um, has brought into the picture the, uh, the fact that you know, we are facing climate change and a brave new world, as it were, it brings the extent of uncertainty into CBA to a new level, bringing all sorts of challenges to, to CBA practice and application. And Susana Murato has uh, made a very, very interesting presentation on the issue of well-being. And uh, uh, if it wasn't complex enough already to, to explain to our decision makers uh, the issues about welfare and so on, what CBA is really telling us, uh, uh, this, this, I, mean, I must say, it, I mean, it, it is, it, it poses a challenge, but it's a challenge in the right direction, I think, because uh, one of the uh, problems that we have when we produce CBAs is, is then telling, explaining it to the decision makers about what, what is it that we are telling them uh, that the financial returns don't tell them. Uh, and then we have to convince you no, know, it's not about jobs. You know, it's not just for the value of the extra jobs that we create with the investment. Is we're looking at social welfare. When we sell the social welfare, say, well, what, what's that? What do you mean? Uh, and then, <laughs> then it becomes challenging. And by all means, anything that is about Im improving, broadening, and, and coming up with easier to understand measures of, of what that is, whether welfare or, or well-being, it's it's a huge help. It's a huge help, I must say. To the actual to actual practice. Okay, so we move on to Q and A. Um, we have 25, 26 uh, minutes left. Um, the first question, the first two questions actually are for Susana Murato. Um, one is how are these measures used to measure the impact of the costs of implementing and operating a policy? That's one. And the second one is to what extent is uncertainty in uh, BSLY taking into account in estimating the value of a well be will be. Susanna, please. Thank you, Doramas, and thank you, Lisa, for the for the questions. Uh, in terms of the impact of the costs of operating a policy and how that reflects into the well-being approach. I mean, if it's market values that you'd use to estimate those prices, I, I don't think you'd, you'd have a need to use the, the well-being approach. The well-being approach is mostly for non-market uh, non values or for things that are harder to measure. Um, but there could be costs that are non-market costs of a policy, in which case you'd uh, think of using the well-being approach. So the unit values for the well-be, uh, the 13,000 pounds that they recommend to be used, they're to be used for whether the, the change is a positive change or a negative change. So benefits and costs, they propose using the same value. They, of course, it's recognized that people value uh, losses and gains in, in different ways. Um, how they think that could be uh, adapted is that um, the, the change in actual well-being from a gain would be different from the change in actual well-being from a loss, but then they'd use the same unit value to value um, whether it's a gain or whether it's a loss. Um, 
it's it's an assumption. Um, there could be better assumptions uh, given that the different valuation of losses and gains, but that's what they propose uh, there. But this is only for non-market um, uh, sort of costs. So the market costs would be um, estimated in the standard way using market prices. In relation to the second question, also a very good question about uncertainty in value of statistical life year and how that translates into the value of a well-be um, that's based on uh, that, that uh, quality estimate. Um, they, the one thing that they say in the guidance is that um, if the, we, the, the values need to be updated regularly, as governments change the value for statistical life year that they use in their appraisal, their, everything then changes, including the, the well-being values, if it's based on that uh, uh, quality and value of statistical life year value. So they say uh, be, this, this value needs to be uh, revised on a regular basis. They also advise the use of um, sensitivity analysis when we have values that are uh, very uncertain or can change. But beyond that, they don't offer any guidance on ranges of values that we could use, for example. They just say 13,000 uh, pounds is the value that we should use. Uh, the value based on the, on the qualities is, um, is, uh, is, 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 uh, is a bit lower than that. But um, that's all they say. They, they, they don't actually specify a range, but they do say we should use sensitivity analysis. And so I think that's the way they, they go around that. Use sensitivity analysis for that and change the value regularly to reflect possible changes in, um, in the, the value of statistical life years value, uh, values used in government. Many thanks, Susana. Um, I, I move on to a question actually by uh, Gabriela Borges. It's, it's a very interesting question. I'm not sure, I mean, there's two ways of interpreting it. It says, um, it says can you please comment about EU experience with CBA in the financial sector? Uh, I guess this is directed to Massimo, and uh, I, I have two ways of interpreting that question. One is uh, use of CBA by the financial sector, and the other one is application of CBA to the financial sector. Um, I don't know whether, Massimo, would you would want to answer both questions, both, in, both interpretations, or you would rather have Gabriela uh, um, specify a bit more specific about what she, what she actually means. Well, if it, if it is the impact uh, on the financial sector, I think, Dora Mas, you are more qualified than me because, after all, the, the European Investment Bank is uh, the uh, biggest uh, development bank in the world. Um, so, in your case, it there, there was an impact, and uh, I suspect that also for some others, development bank, it has played a, a role. I don't know, Doramas, if you have information about about this. Yeah, well, um, I mean, talking about the use of CBA by the financial sector, um, we we see an increased overlap. I mean, we see, for example, that some of the banks with whom we co-finance because the EIB normally uh, can invest up to 50% of, of, of the project cost. But we see that the um, commercial or uh, commercial investment banks uh, um, are increasingly moving into areas of valuing, or, or they, most of them or many of them already have a view on the cost of carbon. I mean, not, not just the social cost of carbon, but also what carbon pricing will imply to uh, the uh, investment to the to the promoters that they advise, for example, right? uh, and they have to take a view on that. I mean, you you cannot invest in a um, in a uh, in my case in an airport. Okay, you cannot invest in an airport without taking a, a firm view of how do you think that uh, how much the passenger will have to pay in twenty or thirty years time. For carbon emissions, uh, um, and and we see that commercial banks are uh, moving into that. Another area where the we see in, increased use is uh, is value in ecosystem uh, and biodiversity. Okay, um, infrastructure, linear infrastructure, and so on. Uh, new new facilities, you know, they, they do have an impact on 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 ecosystems and, and biodiversity as well as various other sectors. And uh, even if 
at the moment there is no need to uh, to conduct a CBA, one, one would expect that CBA will point you in the direction of where future future policy will take you over the life of very long-lived projects. Huh? So ignoring it or, or ignoring what CBAs will have to say about it is something that we've seen that commercial banks have commercial banks have uh, have moved towards without having to be told to do so. Huh? So you see there the private sector acting rationally, as it were, <laughs> rational expectations. Huh? So that's that's one element. In terms of uh, the actual usage of CBA itself by public banks, where well, there, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, divergence in, in use, but but I mean there is a recognition that to the extent that you are going beyond cash flows and into public uh, policy objectives, and uh, um, however that is defined and it varies across across the countries, the, the way the way you address that is is through CBA for the time being. There's no real other tool. Uh, that to, to address that. So the 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 direction of of travel is is towards more CBA, uh, and uh, it was very interesting uh, to see uh, in Massimo's uh, slide how when CBA started to be when guidelines were started to be used in the in the um, in the EU, the, the trend has been to to come with ever thicker. Uh, and more, more detail, more detailed guides to the extent where we are now, which is, you know, we leave it to the the Commission leaves it to the member states to 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 to, to implement to decide. On on the other interpretation, I would just say that uh, uh, to the extent that uh, regulatory impact analysis uses some kind of cost benefit analysis, there is an obvious scope for cost benefit analysis in financial in financial regulation because it should be recognized that uh, in some cases even modest changes in financial regulations uh, may have a lot of social economic impact so i am aware of some work in this area but it is certainly underdeveloped relative to to what it should it should be and I would expect that if we move towards a bank union in Europe with certain rules, uh, some kind of cost benefit analysis as part of a regulatory impact analysis should play a role. Yeah, yes, I agree. Um, Emil, of, of, the, of the three speakers, you came across as being the one a bit more skeptic about markets. Could you, could you please elaborate on that? Yes. Uh, yes, I'm not skeptic on market uh, because we every day we rely on market. I am, in fact, I'm skeptic on public authorities <laughs> uh, because I think that uh, in uh, the present uh, situation of transition, they have a major role to, to take because uh, most, most of the of the changes which have to, uh, to happen uh, are not uh, driven by market forces, but by uh, collective, uh, collective concern. Uh, and uh, can only be uh, arise through uh, collective economic calculations through cost-benefit analysis. And in my view, uh, they should uh, ensure more coherency between the policies they imply, they impulse uh, uh, on each sector because they have a, a, an enormous power to, Im to impulse policy in each sector, in each important sector, which is which are transport, energy, uh, where uh, they are all, already very strong actors, and also agriculture and uh, land use and so on. Uh, and uh, I I am worried by the fact that they don't uh, play the role of uh, coherencies and uh, leader of uh, a clear direction. Uh, which they should, in my view, uh, 
they should, in my view, take. Uh, so you see, <laughs> I, I'm not, I'm not uh, against uh, skeptical about the uh, market, but I skeptical about the role of market in this transition. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Elon Musk is a uh, a lot of uh, good uh, collective uh, instinct and uh, influence, but uh, it's not sure that uh, it's sufficient, it will be sufficient to, uh, to change uh, the, the pace of uh, economics, of economy, and it would be better that uh, uh, public government uh, take more uh, firm, role and leadership. Okay, I mean, staying, staying with you, Emil, uh, 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 a bit longer. I mean, obviously you, the focus of, of your presentation was on, on, on uncertainty, right? So we have this brave new world brought to us with the increased awareness of uh, and policy relevance of climate change, which has brought uncertainty straight into the center of the picture. Yes. Now, tra traditionally in economics, uh, well, one, useful way of dealing with you know uncertainty or our distinguishing between, between uncertainty and risk is risk is anything that you can for which you can quantify probabilities okay and uncertainty is where evidence on probabilities uh, is much weaker or non-existent but it's still uh, one uh, when we give the results of our analysis to the decision makers, they want to have probabilities, you know, even you, you warn to them, okay, look, but this is not, I can give you, I can tell you that it's 30% that this happens, but there's no evidence back in this. This is just almost a hunch. I mean, could, could you please elaborate on how, how you would see at this stage, I mean, over the next two or three years, uh, uncertainty playing a greater role in CBA? Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a huge, uh, huge problem. Uh, which should uh, deserve a lot of, uh, of research and studies, uh, which are now uh, undertook. Uh, my view is that uh, we are very often in between the situation of uh, polar situation of risk, where we know exactly the probability and you can do uh, uh, classical uh, expectation uh, evaluation and total uh, ambiguity where you know nothing. In fact, you have a lot of uh, information, for instance, on the future of climate change, but uh, depending on models and the models are very widespread in their, even in their distribution. So, uh, I think that uh, some uh, some methods surf, uh, such as uh, Maximin uh, can help, can give information. But what I what I fear is that uh, this information is not sufficient to uh, to 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 give the politician decision maker. A uh, robust uh, face in the result and uh, give him, uh, tell him the decision. I think that the decision in that case should be uh, for uh, so the, uh, matters which are uh, matters of collective choice for uh, collective concerns. That those matters should be debated. Uh, and uh, given to the forefront and uh, debated uh, among citizens uh, and uh, decided through a collective choice. Uh, and the, in that case, uh, it may happen that the CBA does not uh, tell exactly what I do, what I must be done, but just to tell uh, if you think that the uh, probability of such event is uh, less than uh, 10 per thousand or 10 of thousands, very small, uh, then the, this decision is uh, correct. And uh, reversely, you have to take the other decision and uh, give the information to the public, to the citizen, to the democratic uh, power, without uh, really uh, telling 
uh, here is this solution which will be done. And I think in the, that in the present, this uh, uh, uncertainty should uh, give uh, pace to uh, more debate. It's already the case in uh, the private, uh, for instance, insurance and reinsurance. You have a lot of calculation, and you have also after that, you have a, a decision which is taken collectively by the the member of the of the board and so on on expert uh, judgment and, and the same in the case of uh, of collective decision such as uh, such as so the implied in transition uh, the, the final decision should be informed by cba but not uh, dictated by cba understood yeah i think actually this issue of, you know, as it were, socializing CBA and, and decision making, um, which is, you know, springs from, from, from what you're saying, links up very nicely directly with one point in Massimo's uh, survey, which is who performs CBAs. Um, Massimo, would you like to elaborate a bit on that? Very important. Yes, there is clearly a, a market for cost-benefit analysis, and um, this market uh, tends uh, to be uh, occasionally biased because uh, um, those who pay for a, a, a cost-benefit analysis uh, uh, a report as part of uh, an investment appraisal project tend to be the promoters while those who uh, do the analysis tend to be consultants. Um, there is nothing wrong uh, about this, except if the, um, those who read the reports uh, in the public administration or in the um, agencies um, do not have the skills to really critically read those reports and discover where there is optimist bias or uh, other other traps that uh, could could be there. So nothing against having uh, this market of consultants working for the public administration on this, but uh, I would urge more hiring in the public administration of uh, economists with the right kind of training to properly properly read those reports. Doramas, can I also uh, um, take the opportunity to, to answer one question in the chat to why there is no Norway? Yes. Uh, <laughs> right. um, um, there is no Norway, unfortunately. There is no more UK that should be there. Um, we focused in the survey on, uh, on member states of the European Union, but uh, uh, I, I think it would be worthwhile to uh, enlarge uh, as a second step the analysis to uh, other uh, um, constituency. The advantage of focusing on the EU member states is that those states uh, has to follow certain rules in public expenditures, in uh, state aid, and, and, and so on. This is different from, from others. But uh, from an intellectual and practical point of view, I agree that uh, country as a UK, Norway, or Switzerland, for example, should be there. OK, thanks. Very good. Um, one question for Susanna. Um, the... I mean, you, you mentioned in your presentation that the theoretical background you know, to justify measures of well-being is still, uh, if I understood you correctly, still weakly developed. Huh? Uh, the, um, I, I happen to have, I mean, in, in, in a, with a very practical aim of explaining to decision makers, some of whom have no training in economics, of explaining to them what a CBA tells you and explaining to them what economists uh, mean by uh, welfare, 
Okay, I I went back not just to a traditional microeconomics or welfare economics textbook, but I went to uh, Mark Blauch's uh, economic theory in retrospect, and he has a number of chapters on the historical development of of, of welfare economics and how the various concepts and you know linking up willingness to pay with welfare and so on. Uh, I mean, it 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 actually opened opened my eyes quite a bit in, into seeing the, the degree of granularity or how complex that issue is. So the question to you is, um, do you see such a development, such theoretical development into well-being as a precondition to measures of well-being being more widely applied to CBA? Or uh, are you happy with the way the Green Book has gone, which is, you know, this looks useful, this looks good, let's use it, and then perhaps let's worry about the granularity of theory uh, as we go along, as it were. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you for that. It's, um, it, it, it's an interesting uh, matter. In, in fact, the theory doesn't matter for applications in practice. We have a whole um, body of um, consultants doing social value measurement in the UK um, and they don't follow any of the academic papers they just do it in their own way in a simple way it doesn't necessarily follow the green book which I think is why it's important to have the green book uh, measures in place because at least they relate well-being measures to CBA and to the general welfare economics even though the, the well-being part is not still uh, as well defined as it could be but without that guidance People just do it anyway, because there's a there's a requirement, for example, in the UK uh, through the Social Value Act to actually do social value measurement. And so people go ahead and do it <laughs> following whatever rules there might be. So it, it is important to have this because at least it's some rules rather than no rules. It is a shame that there's not enough evidence and, and theoretical um, sort of developments of this. Um, and it's it's because it's not a priority. The priorities are, you know, with climate change, as Emil said, there's a lot of money put in certain areas, not necessarily in this development. And so it's lagging behind. I know I have many colleagues uh, at LSE that are experts in this area and keep applying for grants to do this area and the grants are not awarded. So it, it is a little bit that it's not seen as a priority having uh, the actual uh, um, sort of theory there. So I think my view is that actually let's just go and do it because otherwise nothing will happen and maybe this will lead to some more funds to do the actual research behind it rather than the other way around although I'm a little bit uncomfortable about these things being there side by side with stated preferences and revealed preferences which have a lot more body of evidence I would just put it in a different layer of not not at the same uh, sort of level uh, put it at maybe a level below because of the lack of evidence that that's how I would change it uh, but I think it's important to have it there um, to prevent people doing things that are completely incompatible with the Green Book and to, to, to sort of maybe create the impetus for more research in this area. Very good. I mean, it's, it's actually a very, an interesting, very interesting point because we in the EIB also use multi analysis, for example. And one of the things which, which we, and sometimes we have no choice because the projects or the programs in which, to which we apply them happen to be so broad that it's very hard to apply CBA to all the elements of the project. But we do a struggle in linking up the MCA to the CBA and making sure that we uh, value them on the same level playing field. So it, it is actually an issue of, 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 of a lot of you know, practical, I mean, we practitioners, it's, 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 it's an issue that is very relevant to us. Very well, I think we are very close to the end now. We have only one minute left and I'd like to use it to thank uh, our speakers for what uh, has been a very illuminating and a very, very interesting set of presentations. I hope that the audience has found it as interesting as, as I have. And I'd like to, to thank uh, the Trusco School, School of Economic Henry and, and Stephanie for their uh, invitation and assistance uh, throughout uh, this, this webinar. And of course, the uh, Society for uh, Benefit Cost analysis and I'd like to for the invitation and for the for the opportunity to 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 have this this session and of course I, I will also finish with the uh, reference to uh, also that uh, Massimo said at the beginning that there is this conference coming up in September of the, the European edition of this uh, of SBCA 
and that we uh, we look forward to to meeting up again there. So thank you very much to to everyone, and uh, looking forward to the to the next exchange. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank bye. You. bye. bye. bye.